my name is Darren Zupke, and I'm here with Kim Laskowski, who's the Associate Principal Bassoonist of the New York Philharmonic. In this video, we're going to talk about the great French bassoonist Maurice Allard and his recording of the Carl Stamitz Bassoon Concerto, just movement one. And um, I would also like to mention that Kim introduced me to the French bassoon and Maurice Allard <laughs> at a Juilliard Masterclass in 2007. So thank you so much, Kim, for joining me. If you wouldn't mind, please share a little bit about yourself and your experience with Maurice Salar and the French bassoon. Okay, so I'm from Brooklyn and I lived there until I was 20 years old and well into my bachelor degree at Juilliard. In high school, I had a friend who was a violinist and I went over to his house and he said, I have a recording of soon that I got at Sam Ash because we'd all go to the record store and buy LPs and we didn't have a lot of money. And this was in the 25 cent bin. So he said, I, you have to hear this recording. It's, it's called Vivaldi Concerto in E minor. And the bassoonist is fantastic. So I'm sitting down there in his apartment, his parents' apartment, of course. Mm -hmm. And this man starts playing the bassoon. And I immediately knew, I said, oh, he's playing the French bassoon. I said, but, but that's the greatest thing I ever heard. I was 15 years old. And at that very moment was when I knew my road was to get to Maurice Allard, <laughs> however I could do it. <laughs> that's great. Um, because I would listen to solo recordings of the bassoon, but nothing got me like this. The technique was fantastic, but it was the, the expressive quality of his playing that made it so interesting to me. Mm -hmm. um, I never heard anything like that before. Right. That's amazing. So when I, I went to Juilliard, and of course, I'd only be talking about Maurice Allard, Maurice Allard, and people would laugh at me. But it was also at the time that the French and the, mm, the European players who were the virtuosi were really being recognized. And so people would be having discussions about Heinz Holliger, about Maurice Bourg, about um, uh, Pierre Pierre Lowe, people were, uh, Rampal, of course, sure. people were trying to go to these guys and they were getting there. So, um, and my teacher, Harold Goldser, he didn't understand my fascination because he always was putting us on the road of getting an orchestral job. Oh, bless his heart. He was a great teacher and taught me everything I know about reed making and about style. So I really learned a lot with Harold. Sure. Um, but when I was in my master's year, I could apply for a Fulbright scholarship and I applied and I was an alternate, but I, I did get to go because the person before me, I guess, couldn't go. When I got to, to Paris, I um, had to audition and I was taking some private lessons with Allard and he said, well, you know, you have to learn two pieces. And I said, well, you know, Maître, we called him master, of course. Mm -hmm. Right. I, I hope I play well enough because, you know, I'm not really at a high level. And he said, don't worry, you, there are um, 12 places for, um, for Frenchmen and four places for foreigners mm -hmm. and no other foreigners are auditioning. So you're basically, he was saying, I would really have to be terrible to not get in. First of all, it was very difficult to play the French bassoon because the fingerings are not easier than the German bassoon. And it's, it's very difficult to play this instrument, but they were all playing it unbelievably well. And I always think, and I'm very sure that it's due to solfege. Um, they must learn solfege before they take an instrument, at least at that time. And so when they assimilated, when they assimilated music, you know, they had to learn something 
they were thinking of it like note by note. Mm -hmm. So they learn things very fast. And um, a large teaching was very, uh, in one in one respect was very rigid. You know, you had to play the crazy uh, intervals <laughs> and you had to do the melody and then you had to do the crazy hard pieces. And I had not experienced that. So he once said to me, and it really cut me to the quick and I never forgot it, but happily, uh, at some point in my life, I made use of what he said. He said, you just don't assimilate fast enough. And whoa, and he was right <laughs> because I would practice and practice and I'd never get anything done, even though I had some kind of a method. And so um, I had figured it out that it was solfege. I did graduate fifth in my class in solfege. That's out of a mm hundred -hmm. people. Yeah, and that's amazing. But it was the solfeging that uh, that really the way they associate what they're doing with the names of the notes. Sure. Yeah. So he said that to me, and later on in my life, when I was in my forties, I decided to make use of that and learn how to learn faster, and also how to play faster, because <laughs> yes, he wanted us all to play fast, <laughs> and. I came to many conclusions about that. Um, sometimes you have to practice fast to be able to play fast. And you have to like to play fast. Also, you have to desire it. You know, some people, they can, they, they would be scared to ride a bicycle down a, a very steep hill. Mm -hmm. I'm one of those people. I would never do that. Huh? <laughs> I don't ski. I don't roller ski. I don't do any of those things because I don't like to go fast. But at least on the bassoon, I like it. I made yeah. myself like it. I didn't always like it. You know? mm -hmm. So I have to thank him for that. Lately, I practice everything with a metronome on the 16th note, like slow. Mm -hmm. I mean, the 16th notes are like that, that. Right. Right. Yeah. And so I learn it. That's just for learning the notes because, you know, I can't learn like the soulfish people, like soulfish through the whole thing. I'm not going to assimilate. I, I do think quarterly and I know exactly where the harmonies are going, all of that stuff. So at least I have that. But then I make myself play long swaths of things at the breakneck mm. tempo. Okay. And, but as we'll see when we're talking about the stomachs, because mm -hmm. it's a perfect, um, example of what he would do um there are things that he's doing to make it even sound flashier the facility came from uh a number of things uh, yes facility yeah fingers because a lot of discipline practicing um the technical stuff but it's also a philosophy mm. of timing Sure. And we're going to hear that when we listen to the stomachs. He did a lot of things in his playing. If you put it, if you put it in like the amazing slow downer, you can hear yeah. <laughs> how it sounds. He makes it sound like he's playing way more trills when he's not. Really? Um, and he is a huge proponent of technical fingerings, fingerings that are good for technique. It's like you had to learn several different fingerings for things because of note combinations. And I think this is great. I don't think that there is really a proper fingering for anything. It's what works for you. And a lot of people describe him as being very severe. And every day you'd hear like the guys say, Il est très sévère. <laughs> and yes, and we don't say, yeah, you know, oh yeah. He's, because he never raised his voice, you know, but he could really cut you to, to the quick. Mm -hmm. And um, anything could bother him about like, it could be uh, that you didn't practice your stuff, right? And you could have practiced it, but you got so nervous in the class that you, you couldn't 
you know, perform. Yeah, that happens. <laughs> and then, or you didn't play musically. And, or you had a crazy vibrato. Uh, okay, so he could really get to you. But aside from being extremely critical, he also had your best interest at heart. He also had liked to have fun and he threw parties for us all the time. <laughs> and you would think that he was incredibly inflexible. Here was a guy whose who every hair was in place. He came in in a suit and everything was perfect. And he drove a gold Citroën, the kind that was so low to the ground that you, you know, that you were going to scrape your gas tank on, on the pavement. If you came to school with a nice outfit on and you had an umbrella, you were like the example for the whole class. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. But in some other ways, he was extremely flexible. Hmm. Well, yes, he would throw a champagne parties in the classroom on certain holidays. And then we'd have this yearly party where we would all chip in a certain amount and then he would pay the rest. And it was like unlimited liquor and everything. <laughs> oh, wow. And so we would get like just smashed and great food, you know, bouillabaisse or, oh. or paella or something like that. And then we'd all sit down and we'd be playing bassoon quartets and sextets and all this stuff. Okay, so he was a big letter writer um, at Christmas and New Year's time. And he would write to everybody and you know, send Christmas cards or, and write letters. I had two letters from him and I was so shocked when I got them the first letter was to telling me that I should come back to France because there were a bunch of auditions he wanted me to go to. He made you feel how much he missed you. His handwriting is beautiful hmm. and his expression is extremely flowery. He had this philosophy and he spoke about it in a speech and I wish I could find that speech. I have it on a CD somewhere. He said, we are purveyors of the bassoon and we have to put the bassoon out into the public in the best light. Mm -hmm. um, we are selling the bassoon and people are our customers. So, you know, you have to make it as exciting as you possibly can. When he told us we were going to be working on the Stamets, and we all had to play the same thing, you know, there were 13 of us in class, we all play the same thing. <laughs> um, I said, oh, the Stamets, because I had every piece of music written for the bassoon in my music library. And I said, oh, wow. oh that's a very plain piece. I'm thinking this, and I, there's nothing in that. It's not even hard. He gives us the music or says, you've got to buy this music and then you're going to rewrite some of it. So he had for this recording in 1966 or 67 had revised what was actually on the page. The edition that was first available was a Sikorsky publication and it was plain, but the orchestra parts were rather fancy. Oh. So he took material and ornamented the bassoon part from uh, what was going on in the 2D passages. How clever. And um, then later on, after I left France, he published it at Biodo. I can, when the bassoon comes in with the first statement, okay. He has a trill that he starts from above, but if you listen closely, he just does a turn because he's already starting to rush. 
And it almost sounds like he's trying to go faster than the orchestra. And hmm. somebody that was really famous for that was like uh, Yasha Heifetz. Oh. Right? He's always <laughs> trying to beat the orchestra. But if you listen closely, the orchestra is also going along with him. Hmm. So they're making this piece that could be really um, like uh, uh, stodgy and uh, very mm, boring into right. like almost a, a race in a way, but it makes it extremely, um, extremely exciting because there's not that many 16th notes, but when he's playing 16th notes, they are clear and they are uh, rapid and sparkling. Mm -hmm. So we're going to hear him start sometimes before the beginning of a measure or, be, sure. you know, start a phrase slightly early because he wants everybody to, you know, to come with him, but he also wants to sound virtuosic. Mm -hmm. And I always say the, the, the root of, uh, of the word virtuosity is virtuous, right? So, and if you're virtuous, you're on time. In fact, <laughs> you come to um, an appointment earlier. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> um, so, you know, if you're listening to the piece, um, you're going to hear that rushing ahead. So you can see all the notes that he uh, that he added, mm -hmm. and that was taken out of uh, the ornamentation uh, or the actual string parts uh, um, that happened at the beginning of the piece. And you can hear him always trying to move ahead. And in time, he has the three eighth notes. Mm -hmm. He makes sure he doesn't wait. He doesn't he doesn't he's riding on the pulse of the orchestra rather than uh you know using it as his metronome. But the great thing is we listen to it and then we hear yes, the orchestra and the player are really together. But right. it's like two parallel moving trains. Mm -hmm. And that, uh, uh, you know, you know how it is when you're playing a concerto. Sometimes you feel like the orchestra is so behind you. Yeah. And you just have to go with that. Um, so Managing technique, um, when you want to sound fast, it's, it's a matter of timing. Of course, you have to get your fingers used to being able to manage it. And that mm -hmm. means that if you're practicing your scales or something like that, the way you change the notes is very important. Your fingers have to be ready. They have to be loose enough to get to that next note. And so when you were practicing his intervals and you were up to the fifth, sixth, sevenths and octaves, it's very much about getting your finger to the next fingering sooner than you think. And with a, and you have to leave the muscle tension of the last fingering behind somewhere halfway in halfway back in the last note. 
your fingers are already moving to the next note. Wow. If that instrument's very difficult to play in tune, but he's just, he, he's making it sound as beautiful as he can. He's, he knows when he, what he should be forfeiting and what not, or how to make something work that's less than perfect and make it fit into what he's doing. Yes, very true. He wants excitement. He's not going to worry about if one note sticks out because he's thinking, is the music happening? He was only interested in, am I getting the message across? Four sixteenth notes where you have two slurred and two tongue. Oh. He's making sure that the first two notes are really close together. The second sixteenth note that's sl uh, tied to the first with a slur, uh -huh. it has to be rushed to and finished enough for your tongue to get in there, and and then you have to rush through the second two sixteenth notes that are tongued for it to sound stylistically correct. Now, people are probably thinking when they're hearing me say this, that's ridiculous, you know. Uh, you start practicing slow and then you get faster and then, it, no, it's gotta have a certain kind of musical feeling to, uh, because when you, this, the second eighth note has to be sooner. Mm -hmm. It can be and that figure must be like that so it sounds like you know a rock skipping over the water that's and beautiful <laughs> does that so incredibly well yes 100%. to make the technique express because he said in a speech <laughs> Technique is not a means to an end, but it's a very important means. Because when you have more technique, you can express more. <laughs> Thank you so much for taking the time. This was like my biggest pleasure and it was so great to see you again. It's always great to see you. And uh, we'll uh, just be in touch. Yeah.